Howdy. Welcome back to the name of, the, of my little show. It's To Blade. Did you ever see that movie, Princess Bride? Yeah, oh, yeah. To Blade. And I'm here in Aurora, Nebraska with my dear cousin, Buck. <laughs> Buck Music. And just always been one of my favorite people. So, uh, I thought I'd just, I don't know, pick your brain a little bit about some of the things we talk about. One of the things that I was thinking of is, you mentioned the, uh, we were talking about the, uh, that one can think while working on things, you know. You don't just sit, well, think while sitting on your couch pondering. And I don't know how much the overlap in our relationship between the manual arts and thinking and ideas. I feel like a lot of people just sort of think there's the world of ideas and problem solving, and then there's the, the trades, you know. But for most of our lives, it's been a huge overlap in that. Like, you know, you've been really successful at your business. And I think that, would you say that maybe is part of that? What led to that? I mean, why? You're in a town of what? 12,000 people? I don't know, 5,000 5, people. Uh, so in a town of 5,000 people, you run a plumbing and HVAC business. Yeah. And you run it single-handedly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello in there. Hey, what's so important? What you got here that's worth living for? Yeah, everything I do is single-handedly. So you started it, how long into the business before before they had your army? Um, probably six years. Six years, something like that, in this business. How long before the actual surgery did you really know that things were headed that way? Probably six months. Somebody asked me one time if I thought it was worse to know that you're going to lose your arm and have it amputated, or if it would be worse to suddenly lose an arm and have no choice about it. And I said, I pray to God I never fight. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, the uh, the ability to wrestle with the loss ahead of time is nice. Mm -hmm. But I think I didn't appreciate what the loss actually was. So I was wrestling with what I thought the loss was going to be mm -hmm. instead of what the loss actually is. And there have been some real benefits to it. And there have been some surprising downsides that I didn't anticipate. Like I thought, I thought that the biggest loss would be the loss of function, hmm. but it's not. It's the loss of the ability to feel. Really? Absolutely. Interesting. The loss of feeling is 10 times. What do you mean by that? Like tactile? Just the ability to feel when something's slipping. You can't tell when, like, if I put my hook down on something and it's about to slip out. You have no ability to hmm. to imagine that happening before it just immediately happens. <clears throat> um, I gained function with a hook that I lost with my hand in some regards. Like I can snatch a manhole out of the street. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can. I was on a job the other day where. We needed to see what was behind the tile of plaster, and so I just punched a hole in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to go get a tool. I remember when we were sitting around the campfire. So sitting around the campfire came in pretty handy when something fell into the tire. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and you're saying the other day for you feel like you can pretty much do everything by and large categorically that you could do before. Yeah. Except put a wire knot on multi-gauge wires. Yeah, a, a bunch of, a clump of wires that are a bunch of different sizes are really difficult. 
But another thing that's hard is hanging pipe by myself in a crawl space with pipe strap and screws. I, I can do it, but that that is one of the benefits of having lost my arm. Do you really want to be hanging pipe in crawl space? Well, no, not that. Why? Not so much as the uh, the renewed challenge at work. Because <laughs> I was really good at what I did. Yeah. And proficient and efficient. I'd spent you know many years attempting to become more efficient. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you make a, a minor change in efficiency a bunch of times, and uh, it adds up to something significant. Mm -hmm. But after a while, the degree to which you can perfect that is minimalized. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're a first-year apprentice, you've got a long way to go as far as getting better at your trade. Uh -huh. But then after you've been at it for 15 years. Yes, there's still room for improvement. Yes, you can still um, perfect the way you think ahead and do a job in, in your head ahead of time to anticipate difficulty um, and to set yourself up for, you know, three moves down the road. Hmm. Um, so mostly as you get better in the trades, I would say your improvements come because of your ability to think ahead and see ahead and anticipate problems. Hmm. That's good. <clears throat> and I had kind of peaked at the physical challenge of the job and an inability to perfect that. Well, you go from using two hands to one, and that can even be left handed to start with. There's <laughs> 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 a learning curve. How does this door open here? So to to uh, yeah have the have the challenge of physically being able to do the work being renewed has been fun almost yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a whole new set of problems to solve. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. I mean, most people I think you know you're um, a, you know multi talented because you like think and read and talk discuss, but you're also you know a man of uh, building and fixing and problem solving. But um, most people would think somebody who's in the trades, who's right-handed, looking at losing their right arm. I mean, I imagine some people would just throw in the towel. And did, did you ever think about like just going on disability and... Well, the day after they took my arm off, I had a lady come to the hospital room. She started asking me that name, rank, serial number questions um, to fill out a form. And finally, I was like, we just were over this yesterday. Why are we going to covering this ground again? Well, yeah. this is for disability. And I said, I intend to work. And she said, oh, you can. Um, you can earn up to, I forget what it was, like $1,000 a month or something like that. Right. I mean, the equivalent of less than part-time yeah. flipping burgers. <laughs> and, I was like, no, and, you know, even if I can't do what I was doing before, my intention is to be as productive as I can, and I, I don't want this um, uh, and, and mind you, that this happened in the middle of my cancer treatments. So you were already I was physically down and, out. and realizing that I, I suppose before I got cancer, I would have had some pious sounding answer to the question, is your sense of self-worth tethered to your productivity? Sure. And I would have had a pious sounding <laughs> reply that went something like, no, I'm, I'm worth something because I'm made in God's image. And um, sadly, that, uh, <laughs> that belief, well, Ascended to mentally was not a reality really for me. I found that my inability to get off the couch or the inability to make it from the bed to the toilet without recovering in the floor um, was very difficult for my self esteem. Yeah. Um, and I just knew. 
Oh, well, and thankfully that lasted a short enough time that I didn't have the chance to well, write yeah. myself. Uh, you know, to actually solve oh, the problem. Oh, really? You didn't have to learn? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't last long enough for me to really work all the way through. Really? So I, I would have to assume that my self-worth is still tethered <laughs> to my productivity. Um, Which fortunately <laughs> is still, I mean, even that year, you guys cleared quarter million bucks or something. Yeah, it was the best year that I've ever had. And up to that point, and the interesting thing is, is um, I would say before that happened, I thought that I was responsible for providing for my family, but God's the one who provides for us. He just allows me to be the way he's doing that right now. Hmm. So that period though, leading up back to like, your arm was fully functional, wasn't it, for the most part? Yeah. You had that injury. I had a plate in my wrist, and my wrist didn't bend. How did you get that plate? Um, well, I broke in my wrist fighting with my brother as a teenager. And those meta, metatarsal bones, yeah. they're, the blood Carpal supply, metacarpals. metacarpals, they're fed with blood supply only from one end. So okay. when that bone died, it decalcified over the years, and the, my wrist just started collapsing. Yeah. It was uh, to the point where when I would bend it, it would, you could hear it grinding. So okay. finally it was like, all right, I'm going to get this fused. But well, then the cancer somehow set in there. Yeah, which because of the plate and the broken screws, and I had rebroken it, who knows when, um, the uh, assumption was that the pain in my wrist was because of the plate. Hmm. So I had it removed, and then the bone, the, the guy that removed the plate told me that the bone was punky and soft, hmm. but never bothered to do a biopsy. Hmm. So. Since my wrist was fused and the bone was solid all the way across, I shouldn't have been able to bend my wrist, but I could. And uh, he, of course, told me I was just being a wimp. So <laughs> <laughs> that should have been a that should have been a little red flag there. They're calling Buck Music a wimp. <laughs> Something's got to be wrong with your diagnosis. That was the uh, last visit I had with him. Yeah. And then six doctors later, the guy said, "Yeah, this is a bone tumor." Huh. So. So that time when you still had your arm bubble and you knew his days were limited, was it, I mean, I imagine it'd be kind of scary looking to the future and thinking, I'm going to lose my right arm. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that I was incorrect about what the losses were going to be. What were some of the things that you thought that really turned out, I mean, aside functionality, but you Yeah, I thought that I would be unable to perform my work. Mm -hmm. I thought that um, one day I would have some sort of dexterity with my hook, which I just don't have. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that it was going to be a tremendously life-changing and ruinous thing to lose my arm. Mm. And you know, I have to sit here today and tell you that it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> it, it matters so little <laughs> that it, it really is no big deal. Yeah. And uh, I never would have believed that. I mean, if I were to sit down and talk to my prior <laughs> self, um, my prior self would have disbelieved me today. Yeah. And you know, I suppose for good reason, but <laughs> <laughs> so that's been six years ago now. No, no, eight, eight years ago now. Yeah. Um, you're still fighting the cancer. Yeah. You guys have adopted three sons. And I, I, when I talk to you sometimes, I just, my little daily problems just shrivel up. In comparison with every time I hear the decisions, the difficulty of decisions you have to make about different treatments or different, yeah, just approaches to how to, what's, what's been the hardest part of all that? Like, what, 
Surprisingly, probably not the things that you would think. Hmm. Like, people have asked me, uh, you know, how hard is it to know that, you know, that they presumed that death is imminent or that. <laughs> um, what's the. Sorry, I don't know. No, I'm sorry. What, what, what's the earliest sort of time frame that you've beaten? Like, Two years to live, probably, or five years. Well, supposedly it was to start with less than five years, and that was eight years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, people are surprised that I don't mind not knowing hmm. how long I'm gonna last. <laughs> but I point out that nobody knows. <laughs> right. You don't know. So why should I need to know? Right. What difference does it make? I have today to live. Yeah. Um, I would say that to answer your question about what's been difficult is the assessment of today versus the future mm. and where to put the weight and where to. Um, you know, obviously, if you deny yourself something today, hoping for something better in the future, that can really benefit you. Sure. Can. Sure. Um, but it also can be a dramatic negative if you're not anticipating that the future is going to be there once you get there. Sure. So, um, or once you don't get there. Um, so it's been weighing that. that I've probably spent the most thought. Hmm. Just re the relative... Well, the opportunities that you have. I've come to value opportunity as the most valuable thing that I know, other than Jesus, of course. Mm -hmm. the, the most valuable thing that a person has is opportunity. opportunity. The opportunity to spend an evening with your wife. Sure. The opportunity to raise a child, the opportunity to jump at something in business. Mm -hmm. um, the opportunities you have often, once they go by, you can't go back and have them again. Like you can't have last week back. Right. Um, so it's important to assess them as they come along and decide what's worthy of your energy. Hmm. And the other consideration is when you don't have as much energy as you used to, how tired do you want to be when you get home at the end of the day? Hmm. How much how much parenting do you want to have left in you by the time you get done at the end of the day? Um, hmm. I don't know, maybe I'm strange for thinking through that stuff, but I do. Hmm. Are you, have you been able to translate that into, you've talked to other people and encouraged people maybe change their priorities or is it just something you deal with with yourself? Well, I try and instruct my boys in that so that they're not screwing your future selves, mm -hmm. which is a really easy thing to do. And they seem to be very proficient at it. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, the, unfortunately, the desires of the future self are not as strong as the desires of the current self. So, yeah. when there's a complete and thorough lack of self-control, it's obvious which way that scale is going to tip. Sure. But for yourself, it sounds like the opposite metric is kind of what you're working on is considering tilting things more towards just enjoying present. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I guess with this whole virus thing, from the very first day of the shutdown, I said, no, not playing along. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, I mean, of all the categories out there, you're probably one of the most at risk. Well, yeah. I, I'm yeah. on immunosuppressants. And I'm diabetic as well. Diabetic is not good for that. But, 
the reason I said not playing along is because I haven't been given tomorrow. And not that anybody has, mm -hmm. but people presume on that mm -hmm. more than I do, I would say, as a general rule. Mm -hmm. um, Hmm. I'm curious, you know, when you, I don't know, you hear people talk, there's a couple things that I wonder what it's like from your side of things. It, cancer is one of those things that a lot of people feel at liberty to have opinions upon. And particularly in our circles, maybe. Yeah, and you run into people who like to voice their understandings of, you know, like, oh, well, if you just ate blended carrots and had three animals a day, it's, you kick this thing in heartbeat or whatever. Um, how do you deal with that with people that have, because I had a, I had a, a benign tumor and I had to face a bunch of people who presumed to know what I should have done um, differently or whatever. Yeah. No, there's been no shortage of, of emails about this treatment available in Mexico and yeah. eat this fungi or drink tea from this fungi or, I mean, hundreds, yeah. hundreds of different things that people are certain are going to be the cure. Mm -hmm. And I guess the way I've dealt with it is... I've expressed gratitude to them because I know it's coming from a place of sure. wanting the cancer gone. Sure. Um, which I want the cancer gone too. <laughs> so, sure, a lot of the advice is ham handed and um, unhelpful, and but. It's not upsetting when you realize that the reason they're giving you that advice is because they want you around. Mm -hmm. So it makes it kind of hard to be upset. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, the other thing I wonder is like, you know, sometimes you, one doesn't know how to interact with somebody, you know, who's different like that. Like, okay, I gotta make sure I'm not looking at it or I'm not interacting you know, on it. You know, and you want to not do the wrong thing, you want to mention it or not mention it or whatever. How do you deal with that from the other side of the bar? Like, I think kids are the best. Yeah. Because they have no filter about it. <laughs> They're curious. Yeah. And they just ask the question that's on their mind. Sure. And it's so interesting to watch the adults around when they do that mm -hmm. kind of. Hold, you know, suck in their breath and hold it and wait to see if everything's going to be all right. Yeah. But I think one thing that really helps with it is that um, you can tell when somebody's self-conscious. And I do not have the aura of a man who is self-conscious. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I would. All the things I'm playing for it, that's all I have. So, um, I think that really helps. Yeah. You know, if, if, if somebody's... You're really disarming for stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, the jokes. <laughs> Except that, there was this quick-witted woman working at Bed Bath & Beyond. Yeah. Um, and I walked in there one evening and asked where the second hand department was. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, in the, in the far beyond. It's in the beyond. The far beyond. <laughs> the far <department>. beyond. <laughs> That's so cute. She was tracking with it. Yeah, she was absolutely hilarious. That's funny. <laughs> That's, do you think about, um, like, in the beyond, you know, if you think about the afterlife and having bodies do you look forward to or imagine or is that just something outside of the sphere of your imagination? I would say the things that I think about most 
as far as what the ne next life will be is the implications of having knowledge and the ability to learn and the perpetual ability to be surprised about things you discover about God. Huh. And the fact that, you know, we are a part of the bride of Christ. Um, there, it, it's just difficult to imagine a world in which sin and sickness and sorrow and suffering have no place and and you will be there with a I, I believe a complete knowledge of all of the wicked stuff that's available but will have no taste for it mm. because you see God mm. you know the scripture says we will be like him for we will see him as he is so, mm. so there's something purifying about seeing God. I, there's something about that I, I guess I just don't grasp completely or mm -hmm. understand how it could be possible, but you know, Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God and fellowship with him. Um, but somehow that wasn't enough to keep them from wanting something other than him. Mm -hmm. Um, what will be different in the next life that will prevent that from happening? I don't have it figured out, mm. <laughs> but it will be a good thing. Yeah. Now, obviously, our our Creator knows what we need for thriving. And in Revelation twenty one, when it talks about the dwelling place of God is with man, that's a setting straight of the way things are meant to be, and it's a an announcement that human thriving, complete human thriving, is possible. Man, that's, that's a good reminder. Uh, I was talking to a buddy uh, in one of the interviews about, he was suggesting that we don't think enough about the new creation of the restored world. It's hard to imagine the ways, you know, like Romans talks about how the whole creation groans and travails in pain because of, you know, wait, waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our bodies as human, humans. It would be so interesting to know, um, you know, we obviously know that lions didn't used to be carnivorous. Hmm. Um, it'd be interesting to know the ways that creation has been changed. Mm -hmm. You know, when God created it, He looked at it and He said, This is good. And obviously, you know, cursed the ground with weeds. Mm -hmm. So there wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been, a, it's just hard to imagine what creation would be like without the curse. Mm -hmm. I wonder, just kind of going back. Those first days without your arm, you know, it was kind of like like you knew what your body could have been, would have been. It's almost like those early days, you know, that we have in Scripture where you. I guess I'm just drawing an analogy there. You know, this isn't the way your body is supposed to be, but it's the way it is. I don't know. I wonder if there was any, what was that like? And do you yearn to have your arm back or? I really haven't. Really? Um, it, it's interesting how long it took me to grapple with the fact that it was gone. On a physiological level. Really? Um, you know, slipping and reaching out to catch something, but you don't have a hand to grab anything with. Um, and, and your body just assumes that it's there. You don't have time to think when you're falling, oh, that's right, I don't have a hand. But, 
Um, it was years. Really? Yeah, years. Um, or, you know, the mosquito lands in your forehead and you go to swat. You forget that you have a hook instead of a hand. <laughs> huh. um, I was surprised how long it took for that to, really? to settle in. You know, now, I would say it's been probably three or four years since the last time that happened. Okay. But, you know, four or five years of before your body understands that this part's no longer there, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. I, I've also laughed about the, the phantom pains from, uh, you know, just nerve pain. Um, so, like, sometimes it'll feel like somebody's holding a torch to the back of my fingers. Just for the fingers that aren't there. The fingers that aren't there. Yeah. And so, I hurt in the place that isn't there, but I can take real pain medication and it will help. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Weird. Yeah, it is. Absolutely strange. Weird. I look at these guys that, you know, lost both arms or whatever in, in Afghanistan or Iraq, and if they've got you know, two hooks, and I think of how, you know, I have not worked at all to develop dexterity with my hook. Hmm. I use it to smash stuff and <laughs> to tear at stuff, and because I still have a hand, right. I have not tried to develop dexterity with my hook because it's such a far cry from the real thing that it's it's nearly worthless mm. in comparison to an actual hand. Mm -hmm. So I, I think having one finger, one real finger, would be forty times better than a hook. Really? Oh, absolutely. Um, but I look at those guys and the stuff they can do, and you cannot help but feel admiration. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's how I look at you. You're still so far more capable than I am. Without your right arm. It's mind-boggling. At certain things. At certain things. <laughs> I mean, physically capable at fixing things and doing things. Does it, is it a temptation to judge people? Is that tough? Like, here you're dealing with guys and think, gosh, if I had a right arm. You know, and here you are. We mentioned. I like, told you about the guy that quit working for me the other day. What was? What, what happened? He injured his arm at work. Yeah. And uh, I told him if you continue to come in and do what you can, sure, I'll still pay your full wage. Sure. Well, I can't work because I can only use one arm. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you have an idea who you're talking to. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, unbelievable! Unbelievable. Well, one thing that's interesting to me is the, because I was a man when I lost my arm, mm -hmm. and I had my entire childhood, and my entire young adult life, and my, you know, up until 39 years old, with an arm, my view of myself is very different from somebody who loses an arm in childhood hmm. or is born without one. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to understand the dynamic of what it's like to view yourself as handicapped or deficient hmm. and just how poisonous that view is. Hmm. Because I've, I've run across people who have been disabled from childhood who don't have that viewpoint. Hmm. But then a large percentage, I would say a larger percentage of people who are handicapped at birth view themselves as part of their as unable. Yeah. But I think it's a poisonous hmm. viewpoint, even for somebody who has very obvious deficiencies. If you, because it, it prevents you from trying, mm. it, it, you start from the position of defeat mm. instead of a position where I can overcome this. Mm. And 
I met a guy who had no arms, and he could take a pack of cigarettes out of his pocket with his toes and light it with a match. Really? Yes. <laughs> and he did not view himself wow. as unable to do what he needed to do. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. Yeah, that's, I guess that's been one uh, just great thing that I've been able to glean from you through that process. It's just the attitude, which is an old attitude. You think of granddaddy, my granddaddy. You can met right your age, granddaddy. No, currently you never met? Mac? Mac, no. Really? No. Okay, well he had the attitude if somebody can do it, I can do it. You know? Yeah. You know, nothing just seemed on a different realm. Well, that's what that's for the experts. So that's and I feel like that has for you, not only in the world of things, but also in the world of ideas. Like, you know, I meet a lot of people in the trades who think of the world of ideas as something for a different class of people. Whereas you move seamlessly in between problem solving plug plumbing problems to theological questions, political history, philosophical. Like to you, to me, when I talk to you, it just seems like some, you know, it's all just a world at your disposal. Like you're able to navigate through and think about why do you think some people make that that uh, division? I'm just curious because I guess it's just rare to me to find somebody. Either I have friends that that read and know about history or whatever and, and can't change a tire, or I have friends that are you know tradesmen but don't really truck in ideas or in humanities. You know, you're a rare breed, but something I feel like used to be around a lot more. An ideas man who's in the trades. Where does that come from and how? I can't, I can't pretend to understand why other people think the way they do. Mm -hmm. I just know for me, being boxed into a little... area of esoteric expertise is too confining. Mm -hmm. I love hearing other people's ideas mm -hmm. and mulling them over. Mm -hmm. um, I love talking to people that have different viewpoints than me because they know something that I don't know. And it's just so interesting to hear why people think the way they do and their ideas will challenge yours and it gives you an opportunity to either improve your ideas or to fasten another candle on that <laughs> idea and not let go of it and realize this is a good idea. Yeah. Um, I guess just intellectually plumbing just isn't enough for me. Sure. I'm hungrier than that. Sure. And I don't know why other people don't share that hunger for knowledge and for it's not just knowledge, but it's it's an understanding of how this place works. Well, see, that ties in though with me. I think it's a two way street. That is, I think that attitude is not only broaden your horizons intellectually, but I think it's one of the reasons that you're extremely successful as a plumber, hiring people who failed at being a plumber in the same community because you bring that the ideas of problem solving and a broader thinking and appreciation of, you know, a diversity of perspectives into the trades, maybe. Do you think that's something going on? I mean, why are you so successful 
a business, a business where other people are failing. It's hard to imagine a well-run plumbing shop <laughs> not, make, not making money. Because no matter what's going on, people need their toilet to flush. Sure. So, my assumption is that if there's a failing plumbing business, it's because somebody's not doing the fundamentals. It has to be. Hmm. Because if you're busy working all the time, and your invoices <laughs> cover your labor and materials, how can you not make money? But you mostly hired people who weren't making money plumbing. Or some of that. So some of the problems I see that are rampant mm -hmm. at the plumbing supply, they give you a one and a half percent discount off of your monthly bill if you pay it by the tenth of the month instead of waiting until the thirtieth. Yeah. Show me another investment you can make <laughs> where in twenty days you gain one and a half percent every 20 days. Yeah, that's like I mean, an annualized yeah. almost 25% return on the money. It's crazy. Yeah. But according to the guys at the plumbing supplier, I'm one of the few people who pays <laughs> my bill by the 10th. But why? I mean, that is, even if you had to take out an operating loan, it would be cheaper. It would be right? way cheaper money than paying the plumbing supply that extra one and a half percent. And then on top of that, if you don't have an inventory to work off of for all of your common parts, look at the productivity lost by a man driving 20, 30 minutes to the supply house each direction and picking up what you didn't have on the shelf that you should have. Mm -hmm. So there's an hour of productivity out of an eight hour day. So you're talking a heavy percentage of that man's productivity was gobbled up by the lack of a $3 part. Which was really a lack of imagination. He didn't imagine, the kind of what we started out with, the ability to imagine a job, walk through it in your mind, imagine everything you'll need. I mean, don't you think that's the main... And that's the, that's the thing that prevents you from forgetting something when you get back to the shop to pick up parts and you're going to a job that's 20 miles away, is you do the job in your head while you're at the shop so that you don't forget any of the parts because the loss of productivity driving from the job to the shop is disastrous as well. And, uh, you know, there's other things like the, um, the discounts you get when you buy in bulk. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that you know you're going to use up this quantity in six months, mm -hmm. you buy the whole box of PVC fittings and get a 10% discount. Sure. Um, that's just money in the bank. Sure. You know, you buy a partial box, it's 10% more money. Right. But if you can afford to sit on, I mean, you can hardly not afford to sit on right. that box of fittings for that few months, even if you have to take an operating loan out to do it, sure. you're still way money ahead. So I don't know if people just don't think about that stuff or hmm. don't care about it or as far as we're talking about just your interest in history, philosophy, literature, just sort of ongoing, you know, concern for humanity is how do you fit that in? Do you, is it just something you I mean uh, do you have any kind of a discipline for that or is it just something you do in your spare time? Because it seems like you're always reading thinking, talking about something. It's not something I do in my spare time. It's no. something I do while I'm driving. Okay. While I'm fixing furnaces. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy, um, oh, I'm part of a couple different men's groups, one at Sunday school. Um, the stuff that's discussed there is my fodder for thought for the week. Hmm. So, um, there's no reason you can't be thinking about other stuff while you're working. Hmm. Yeah. It, it just enriches your it day. It just enriches your day. <laughs> yeah. 
That's good. Yeah, I just would, I personally would love to see more of that, you know, interdisciplinary. I don't know, because I also really appreciate the trades and the world of ideas. And I think people that are pigeonholed to one or the other really lose from that. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of uh, academia that divorces their ideas from daily life. Mm -hmm. And they don't they don't see the logical end in practice mm. of what they're saying. Mm. Where the rubber meets and the there's road. A, there's also a lot of politicians who are that way too. Sure. You know, they they want the thing that's expedient for now and that sounds good and that has a good sound bite, but they refuse to think through the disastrous implications. And there aren't very many pieces of sweeping legislation that have a desired effect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Unintended consequences. Oh, well, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I wonder if it's a lack of incentive. They don't have skin in the game. Or if it's just a lack of uh, character, where they just whatever is expedient now. Well, with politicians, I'm sure a lack of character looms large. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> I, I enjoy brilliant thinkers like Milton Friedman. Sure, who was just absolutely incredible at making economics understandable for the mm -hmm. common man. <laughs> he had this thing that <clears throat> I heard him, or, or saw a video of him saying that there's four ways to spend money. Um, you can spend your own money on yourself, in which case you're concerned about not only the quality, but the price. Or you can spend your money on somebody else, in which case you're less concerned about the quality and still concerned about the price. You can spend somebody else's money on yourself. <clears throat> like when the boss gives you the credit card to go to lunch. Sure. You'll be mostly concerned about the quality That's and funny. don't keep as much of an eye on the price. And then there's the way politicians spend money, which is spending somebody else's money on somebody else. <laughs> and <laughs> in that case, you don't care about either the price or the quality. And uh, wow, that's it's just great. a brilliant analysis. It's great. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, little things like that are so clear. That's, yeah, that's great. And uh, you were the one who got me into Albert Nock. How did you stumble on him? Oh, um, I've heard of him since, but I've never heard of him before. Now I see his name come up. Yeah, somebody gave me the... I'm trying to remember the name of it. The problem of being educated <laughs> and the disadvantage, <laughs> the disadvantage of education. education. Yeah. yeah. And I read that and I was like, this man is brilliant. <laughs> 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 and he was just a, a, a clear thinker and articulate and um, yeah, I mean, in that essay, he absolutely laid out the disadvantages <laughs> of being educated. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, I wonder sometimes, like, you've been through so much and you've, you know, felt so much change. Like, it seems like you've, you know, in talking to you, that you, there's certain aspects of your life that have stayed the same, you know. It seems like you've undergone a lot of change over the years. Absolutely. What would you, if you had to like send a sentence back to former you, which former you would you like to talk to? What iteration of yourself? And what would you tell them? Like just one blur. If you could tell some iteration of your past self. So I would definitely interrupt my life prior to 
2002. It was at that point that I changed what I was pursuing in life. Hmm. Um, up to that point, I was living for myself hmm. and to satisfy my desires. And I thought, when God asked me to do something, if I'm obedient to him, that means I'm going to be missing out on something. Hmm. I'm going to fail to enjoy the things that I want to enjoy. Hmm. What I didn't appreciate is the fact that he's the one who made me. Hmm. And when he tells me to do something, it's because he knows it's good for me. Hmm. And up to that point, I looked like the two-year-old screaming for cookies when I needed to be eating my vegetables. Hmm. Um, the parent knows that the, that the cookies long-term are going to be the good things, so they offer the vegetables. But, but it's more than that. Hmm. It's, it's not just that it's vegetables. It's peace of mind and peace of being able to just be at peace with the world and, mm -hmm. and be okay when things go wrong. And um, so I guess the message that I would give myself prior to that is that Jesus is the only valuable thing worth pursuing. That's the only pursuit in life that's worthwhile. When you say that, I mean, what do you mean by pursuing Jesus? Being 100% committed to following him and allowing, allowing him to dictate to me how to do life. Like the commandments in the New Testament, are they like Christ's commands? Or? I guess I would sum it up this way. The, the parables of the treasure in a field, where a man finds a treasure in a field, and he sells everything else in order to possess it, or the pearl of great price. Mm -hmm. Like a merchant comes across a pearl of great price, and he sells absolutely everything else that he has in order to possess it. It is just the realization of Christ's value. Mm -hmm. that there isn't anything else more valuable. And if you don't place him as the most valuable thing, it will cause you to misorder the other things in your life. And, and you will place priority in things where it doesn't belong. It's just absolutely transformative to live that way. Well, I, I hear you and I agree. But I wonder... Like what that, how that works its way out practically. Like, what does it mean to value Christ? What is it? How does that work out? Like, you have decisions to make, you know, bills to pay, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. People, strains on your life, constraints, dreams, visions, regrets. I would say that one of the biggest implications of it is a love for others yeah. and a a vastly increased ability to forgive others for their shortcomings and a an appetite to to help to help other people there, there's not a single person you run across who's not struggling with something and it's, it's just amazing how um, how useful it is to remember that when you're interacting with people yeah. I guess that's such a 
big part of the, the message of Christ was that how you treat the weakest, the most annoying, the most intrusive in your life, that is how you're treating Christ. Right? It's the message that like the yeah, rest of these is. It's interesting how like maybe another way to talk about living that way is to to say that it's uh, making Jesus the Lord of your life. Hmm. To where he's in charge. He has the right to right to say how this is going to go down. <laughs> but how does he communicate that, though? With his word? Like through scripture. Yeah. And by the, by putting something on your heart, conviction, just yeah. enter. Um, I would say it's, it's very obvious that somebody who has a lot of knowledge about God from reading the scripture but doesn't know him by pursuing him and walking, you know, he says, "If you see, uh, you will. If you search for me, you will find me. If you seek for me with all your heart, all your heart." So if you're if you're abandoning everything else and seeing everything else as lesser value than him, and pursuing him, you will find him. He will show himself to you. And uh, gratefully, he'll change your desires. When, when he says uh, that he'll give you the desires of your heart, that doesn't mean You'll Those, finally get the Corvette you always yeah. want. No, it means that when you when you find him, you find satisfaction and peace of mind and and abundant life. Yeah. Ah, good. Should you share that? And of all the people I know who have abundant life as much as we can have in this world, I would put you at the top. It's just people who are Happy to be alive. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and like the rest of us, you don't know how long I'll be. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time, man, to just talk with me. And hopefully we'll be able to share some of that with some people. I think it's, uh, it's been good knowing you and having you as a cousin, a brother, and a friend. And uh, yeah, interestingly, although we talked about it at length, just because it's a unique party situation, your amputations have little to do with our friendship. <laughs> it hasn't changed that in a way, on the way either. Um, yeah. Was, is there anything else just on your mind or heart? Think worth sharing, thought or story or advice, insight, question for me, or for just the universe. Well, I guess there's one thing that crosses my mind every time I see you, mm -hmm. the last few times at least. Um, Something that you told me has just been really helpful to me hmm. is that God is our Father. I was struggling with <clears throat> not wanting to ask Him to take can my cancer away hmm. because I thought that if He said no, it would shake my faith. Hmm. Um, but it was your insistence that. God is a loving Father. Um, I thought about that. I still think about it. Um, it has absolutely changed the way I look at Him. Um, and you set that off. 
<laughs> Good. I'm glad I. Yeah. I wonder what how that related to that question. Let's just open the door to to noticing in Scripture His benevolence towards human humans, and I think it's Romans three. One of the things that Jesus accomplished on the cross, besides paying for our sins, was to vindicate the Father for his mercy towards humans. Hmm. He, he drank God's full cup of wrath against our sin so that God could be merciful to us hmm. and still be just. And I think there's so many places in Scripture that you can look and notice God's heart for people and his wanting us to be right with him and his, <clears throat> his provisions for that to happen. That's from the war part of the Father. Mm -hmm. That's good. That makes his brothers. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and cousins. You see you shared something with me that is maybe okay. If we are uh, to hurt somebody else who's part of you know, if we are one body and to hurt another child of God is to hurt yourself. You know, to distance yourself would be like cutting your own arm off. To distance yourself from another one of God's children because we're part of one body. Yeah, the implications of being one in Christ are humongous. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, I think my thoughts about that really started at a wedding. Really? Yeah. Um, there are the passages from Genesis where Eve was created, and for the first time, I realized that Eve was taken out of Adam. Hmm. So whatever Adam was at the beginning included Eve. Hmm. So when God separated the two of them and gave them to each other to be married, and the two will become one flesh, hmm. he was setting back, he was, restoring, he was restoring Adam to the way things were meant to be. Hmm. And then that, of course, caused me to start thinking about Christ in the church. Mm -hmm. So, when we are in Christ, things are back the way they're meant to be. We're restored because we have renewed fellowship with God. Right. And, you know, like, again, Revelation 21 talking about the dwelling place of God is with man. The, the, the whole story of Scripture from the fall and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden to Revelation 21 is the story of what God did to set things straight mm. because we screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good story. It's a happy one. Yeah, it certainly is a good ending. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, that's a good ending for us. I better hit the road. I've been holding back any reasonable hour. Oh. Thanks, man.